Hello everyone, my name is Pedro Oliveira. I'm a cardiologist with Virtual Veterinary Specialists and in this short webinar we will discuss what to do when faced with a patient with ventricular arrhythmias. As you know, ventricular arrhythmias originate from the ventricular myocardium and because the electrical impulse is transmitted very slowly cell by cell until all of the ventricular myocardial cells are depolarized, the QRS on the ECG looks very abnormal, wide and bizarre. If an impulse travels normally within the heart, it would come from the sinus node and then travel through the conduction pathways, AV node, and then down to the ventricles via the bundle branches. And the bundle branches conduct electricity very quickly, so the QRS complex is narrow. It takes a shorter amount of time to depolarize all of the ventricular cells. When the impulse comes from the ventricles themselves, it cannot use this pa these normal pathways. So the, the impulse travels slowly, resulting in a wide QRS. So uh, if this was a cat, the normal QRS would be lower than 40 milli uh, milliseconds. And if it was a dog, it would be 60 to 70 milliseconds. So anything above that is abnormal. It's wider. Now, it is also possible that we have a bundle branch block that would cause the same appearance of the uh, QRS. So how can I distinguish one from the other? With ventricular tachycardia, as we said, the impulse comes from the ventricle and travels slowly cell to cell until all of the cells are depolarized. And this takes time. So the QRS is wide and is bizarre because the impulse does not travel in the normal fashion, so it will look different. Uh, in this case, negative, because it's coming from the left side of the heart and traveling towards the right. So in lead 2, that would appear as a negative wave. Now, if we have a bundle branch block, the impulse comes from the sinus node, travels quickly to the AV node and depolarizes the atrium in the normal fashion way, and then uh, there's a block for example in this case on the right bundle branch, the impulse still travels quickly to the left side and then to depolarize the right side it needs to travel slowly like the ventricular ectopic beats. So the QRS will look the same, wide and negative in this case because it's coming from left to right. Now the difference if you notice are the P waves. You can see P waves here getting closer to the QRS and then merging with the QRS, you see this is a P wave, and then after the QRS, which means that these P waves are not um, causing the QRS, they're not linked, they're happening at the same time. So the atria are being depolarized by a sinus rhythm and the ventricles are being depolarized by a ventricular rhythm. In this case, because there's a bundle branch block, this is still a sinus rhythm, so we still have P wave and then a QRS, P, QRS, there's always a P before the QRS and most importantly the interval between the P and the QRS is always the same because everything happened normally s until the AV node and then there was a blocked bundle branch which is why the QRS looks abnormal. Everything else is normal. Okay, now if you have uh, all the beats are abnormal, ventricular tachycardia, you can for example if you see these uh, beats that have a narrower QRS, they're called fusion beats, they tell you that there's no bundle branch block in this case, or if you see normal sinus beats, you know there's no bundle branch block, these beats are all ventricular. These ones, if you notice the QRS is still abnormal, that's because they are fusion beats. They are beats that you have a sinus beat traveling to the ventricles in a normal way, and at the same time there was an ectopic beat travi traveling abnormally and they meet in the middle. So they cause a QRS that it's neither normal or abnormal, or completely abnormal, let's say. Good. So, what should I do when I have a patient with a ventricular arrhythmia? Well, ECG, uh, whenever there's an arrhythmia, you need an ECG to see what arrhythmia you're dealing with. And then, we need to know what's causing it. And uh, it's not always heart disease. There are a lot of extra cardiac diseases that cause damage or inflammation of the heart muscle that leads to ventricular arrhythmias. So we need to know, especially in dogs. In cats, most of the time, there will be an underlying structural heart problem. But dogs, it's not uncommon to have an extra cardiac problem, for example, a splenic mass 
gastric torsion, sepsis, pancreatitis, electrolyte imbalances. Those, those are all examples that I'm sure you've all come across. The blood analysis should include hematology and biochemistry as usual, but make sure you include the electrolytes. If it's a cat, check thyroid. Uh, if you suspect inflammatory infectious diseases that, that you can check, you know, for uh, pancreatitis, tick-borne diseases, do that. And also, if you can, include troponins, because that will show you whether there's an active inflammation damage to the heart muscle. If the results are very high, you need to suspect myocarditis or inflammation uh, caused by another problem. Blood pressure is always good practice in any cardiac patient and especially ventricular arrhythmias may lead to hypertension and that's how we're going to decide if we need to treat that patient or not. So you should always measure blood pressure. A heart scan is also very important because we need to know whether there's underlying structural heart disease also, we need to know whether systolic function is appropriate so we can see if the antiarrhythmic drugs we choose are safe or not. Then there are other tests that we will need after a consultation with a cardiologist, after seeing if there is heart disease or not. A halter is often necessary with any arrhythmia because that's the only way for us to know the severity and frequency of the arrhythmias. Uh, abdominal ultrasound and chest x-rays um, may also be necessary if there's a, a, an extra cardiac problem that we suspect. So, how do I decide whether I need to treat a patient or not? Well, it depends on what's happening. If I just see isolated ventricular premature beats, or two in a row, which is a couplet, three in a row, or uh, uh, more organized forms, that tells me that there's there's a problem and we need to investigate but it doesn't tell me that I need to treat straight away okay I need more information I need to do those tests I need a halter to tell me the frequency and severity now if I see something like this so if you have ventricular tachycardia then you may need to treat the first example shows you a rhythm that has a heart rate of 125 beats per minute this is not tachycardia this is an idioventricular rhythm now um, idioventricular rhythms are most common with extracardiac problems so what I need to do is investigate that problem and treat it okay often that will make the arrhythmia better or go away also these rhythms are not always causing hypotension if they are or if they're faster than 160 180 beats per minute so you have tachycardia then you may want to treat but if they're lower than that and they're not causing low blood pressure then we don't need to treat. They often also don't respond to treatment. Typical example is a splenic mass. Now if you have something like this, 250 beats per minute or th of about 300, these are cases that are showing clinical signs. Hypertension, weakness, fainting episodes, and they may be at risk of flutter and fibrillation and death. So we need to treat these patients. Now if this is a dog, then lidocaine would be my first option. I would give a two milligram per kilogram bolus IV. I would go up to three boluses uh, with five to 10 minute intervals between them and give the bolus slowly. If there is a response, then you will need to follow up with uh, con contus, uh, continuous rate infusion uh, with 50 to 80 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Don't use lower than 50 because it doesn't work. Now, if there's a response to lidocaine, then and you need a solution long term, you need an oral solution to uh, continue the treatment because lidocaine after 48 hours will not work and it's expensive uh, to have a continuous rate infusion. So mexilatine is an option, is a drug that works like lidocaine and is available for us. 5 to 8 milligrams per kilogram TID starting orally. You can start them at the same time and then after, normally I, after 12 hours I, I just keep the mexilatine and stop the lidocaine. Um, or Sotolol. Sotolol works very well, but you need to make sure you know from the heart scan that systolic function is appropriate. If it's not, then we can still use it, but I would recommend consulting a cardiologist because we can uh, lead uh, to worsening of systolic dysfunction if we use it and heart failure. 
If this was a cat, then lidocaine unfortunately is not a good option because it leads to neurological signs, vomiting, tremors, di uh, seizures. So you, it can be used, but often, in my experience, it just leads to a side effects. So I prefer starting oral medication. Uh, normally a tenolol 6.25 to 12.5 milligrams per cat. I normally start low once a day and then increase it twice a day and then increase it further if necessary or sotolol 1 to 3 milligrams per kilogram BID. Now sotolol is more expensive because to dosage for uh, such a small patient you need to formulate it uh, purposely for this uh, but it is it would be my drug of choice if it wasn't for that uh, detail. Okay. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, we have a more detailed uh, webinar on ventricular arrhythmias. Please have a look at that. And uh, I just need to disclose that the pictures were used uh, with permission from this book. Please feel free to contact us if you need any help managing your patients. Thank you.